I want to go back to this thing about interpretive narratives. That is one phrase for it. And as a kind of shorthand, I'm simply going to call them stories. But you'll soon see what I mean. These are the means by which we mediate this information in the social context by what we tell ourselves about what it is and what it means. <coughs> These stories are under a constant state of change. The first awareness that there was a serious problem with potentially with climate because of carbon dioxide increases goes back to 1965 and onwards. Over that time, a number of competing, shall we say, storylines or narratives have appeared. The first thing, going back to the point about worldview, is in essence, climate change is a resource-based problem. But it presents itself as, as a crisis of industrialism. It creates itself as, here is, here is the evidence that, that our lifestyle, the way we behave, the way we've chosen to develop, is potentially affecting the you know, the entire global, we could say, the, in deep ecology, we say the web of life. When this information comes out, we have to ask, who are the first people to pick it up? And of course, the first people to pick it up are the ones for whom this information most neatly locks in with an existing worldview. In other words, people have the least personal challenge of accepting it. That is people who are already, we could say, within the environmentalist, political, you know, political ideology. These are people who can readily absorb the information which is coming in. Environmentalists then take control of this information and it becomes stamped irrevocably as an environmental issue. Now, there's nothing intrinsically, I'm, I'm very dubious about this word environment, because there's nothing intrinsically environmental about it. We can say it's a resource issue. We can imagine conditions under which climate change was a, a very different kind of problem. For example, if Here's a wild one. Supposing, supposing the effects of putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere was to mean that nuclear weapons failed to trigger. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's a ludicrous one. So, like, you know, whenever anybody sets off a nuclear weapon, something has happened up there which means they don't work anymore. You can better believe there wouldn't be an environmentalist seen anywhere near the issue. <laughs> They'd be delighted. We can imagine a situation where climate change was something created by one nation state alone and affected another nation state alone. It would not be an environmental issue, it would be an international relations issue. If climate change was not something that was created for our personal behavior, it was an act of deliberate malignancy. Imagine, for example, that America, the CIA, found that North Korea was putting gases into the atmosphere that were changing the world's climate. And then on top of that, imagine that hurricanes were increasing in the Gulf of Mexico and Hurricane Katrina happened. The entire social context, the entire metaphors of it would not be environmental, they would be, actually they'd be war, let's face it. It would lock in with an existing framework. So, as it happened, environmentalists were there first. That then meant that from that point on, the dominant storylines were the ones created by the environmentalist mindset. That means, for example, storylines of coming global apocalypse fit in very strongly with that mindset. Not stories of opportunity, not stories of, of challenge, but stories of, of global collapse fit in with a, certain kind of, you know, with a certain kind of set of attitudes. It also means this kind of thing has become irredeemably stamped on climate change. This, for example, is, this is something I often, ah, have your, have your props ready. This is something I always carry around with me. Here we are, this is typical. Little actions, big impact. There we are. Canvas bag, because as we know, canvas bags are good for the environment, despite the fact that they make hardly any difference. Little, I mean, for climate change also. I'm not saying plastic bags are not a good thing. Um, little actions, big impact with a ruddy big penguin in the middle. All of the language, the metaphors, the images of climate change have been created through a process of environmentalist engagement. Here we, you fly, I die. Guilt, too. Lifestyle guilt associations. Polar bears. Polar bears are an absolute disaster for climate change communications. They are a long, long way away, and they're not relevant to people's concerns, unless you care deeply about polar bears, which, let's face it, rules out an awful lot of the population. That's another form of dominant discussion. Here's another way that climate change is engaged with the existing worldview. In this case, it's a shop your way out of it. Here we are. Buy, buy towels, save the planet. And here is a way that it fits with a government political ideology, which is one of personal choice and personal action. 
In other words, you can do your bit, your bit, not we're going to do our bit, you can do your bit, you can take small and easy steps which collectively add up to major ones. Doesn't I have to say mobile phone chargers make virtually no difference to energy consumption, but what we're going to do is we're going to tokenize that and put it up, and that fits within a political ideology which is one of personal choice and personal action. These are all the dominant metaphors which are already, and dominant, so we say, storylines which are already out there. That means that new people coming on board have real problems engaging with it, unless they happen to share an attitude with some of those. And here's a very good example. I did a little piece of research on the engagement of non-environmental organizations. Now, Human rights is very interesting. Climate change is, in my view, without doubt, the largest human rights and social justice issue of all time. We could imagine if, for example, the first people to the ball had been Amnesty International, the entire language and storylines of climate change would be framed in terms of their concerns, or indeed, say, unions, or indeed, any group. Here's a set of typical organizations. I just did a very simple thing. I just said, how many times on their website did they mention the phrase climate change? And there was the result. Amnesty International at that time did not mention the world's greatest threat to human rights one time on their website. In order to kind of prove this doubly, I did a word check on something which had no reason whatsoever for being on their website. And that was the phrase ice cream. Ice cream is not a major concern for refugees and international human rights, such as Amnesty International and so on. And this was how many times the phrase <laughs> ice cream appeared on their website. Now, this is, of course, cheeky, but it's also highly relevant. I did then a number of series of in-depth interviews with key figures from these organizations. And what appeared clear on that was that there had been a, a kind of a deliberate decision within the organizations that climate change was outside, again, what we could call their norms of attention. It was an environmental issue, an environmentalist issue, and therefore it's very hard for them to get their deals. In other words, the meeting point of this issue and the worldview was an immense obstacle for them to overcome. And therefore, because their brains had kind of fused with how to fit it in, they had actually decided actively not to mention it. Ice cream, of course, isn't excluded from their norms of attention. It's simply irrelevant. That's why ice cream appears much more. I'd now like to focus in on some of these storylines, because I think these are very interesting and relevant. Here's a piece of research which is done in Switzerland, um, and I think it's kind of interesting because it actually directly addresses this issue of, of denial. It had a group of focus groups, and it was trying to get to the bottom of what are the actual, shall we say, storylines that people put up in resistance to information about climate change. Storylines emerge, some come, some go. Those storylines then become consolidated through a social norm process whereby they practice them with other people, they hear them from other people. And we're starting to see a situation now where after this initial period, when there was a kind of a potential free-for-all in terms of how we message and, and understand climate change, they are starting to now to, I would say, consolidate in certain clumps of attitudes or storylines. Now the point of social norm which makes these so powerful is that if you have a storyline on climate change, and then you practice it with your friends, or your colleagues, your peers, or you hear it back from them, it becomes reinforced as a belief. Regardless of whether in any shape or form it can stand up to challenge from outside, or it meets with the, with the external information you're receiving. Because the greatest determinant of personal belief is what, basically what the people around you are saying.